Okay, you see it's recording. Okay. Right. This is Leora Alderson with GardensAll.com and my husband. Her lesser half, no. Coleman Alderson <laughs> no. with GardensAll.com. Not at all. He's, uh, he's the main gardener here and I do kind of the technical stuff and computer stuff a lot. And we've been really looking forward to this interview with Dr. Tom Cowan. Welcome, Dr. Cowan. Thank you. Thank you for having me on your show. And a little bit of background on Dr. Cowan is that he's a principal author of the popular book, The Fourfold Path to Healing, and co-author with the Nourishing Traditions book of Baby and Child Care. And if that title sounds familiar to our gardening audience, it's because many people really love Sally Fallon's book, Nourishing Traditions, with whom he co-authored that book. His latest book, Human Heart, Cosmic Heart, A Doctor's Quest to Understand, Treat, and Prevent Cardiovascular Disease, is a passion subject born from his own medical condition of the heart. Uh, and it's also info-packed with some very provocative uh, concepts that we found, find intriguing. We're not going to talk so much about that in this interview as much as we would love to. We could spend days uh, talking with Dr. Cowan and learning from him because he has a vast wealth of knowledge on so many subjects, including deep dive into the human health part and, and physiology, as well as plants and growing things and how they connect, of course. And so that's going to be our focus today for the Gardens All and Planting for Retirement crowd. Um, and we'll have to hopefully pick up on the others another time. And we, you also authored the book, um, How to Eat More Vegetables and Why You Should. Is that the right title? Uh, it's actually How and Why to Eat More Vegetables. How and Why to Eat More Vegetables. Off on, okay. And on done, book. Sorry? It was kind of a takeoff on my favorite gardening book, which is How and Why, How, I think how and why to grow more vegetables by John Jevons. Okay. Oh, yeah. yeah. Kind of the only gardening book I ever read. So. <laughs> well, if for you to pick one, that was a great that, one. You know? It's the yeah. best one ever written. I'm convinced. Absolutely. We'll link that in our interview as well as yours. In fact, we have a little treat for our audience. Uh, thanks to, we spoke with your son, Asher, and he said that um, we would be able to offer our audience uh, a free download of the PDF uh, yeah. ebook of that. And so we're really looking forward to sharing that with our audience. Um, it's a quick read and yet information packed uh, and only about a hundred pages, I think. And beautiful recipes, by the way, the, you want to crawl inside and start eating those, those pictures of all the <laughs> food that somebody has a talent for yeah. making things look appealing. Was that your wife, Linda? Uh, well, my wife, Linda, did the pictures, and my son and, uh, what do you call her? Uh, Daughter-in-law. Daughter-in-law. Uh, um, <laughs> they did the recipes, so Great. Joe is the chef in the family. Okay. Yeah. Cook a little bit, but Joe, there's a difference between cooking and chefing. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Definitely. It Joe definitely. is the chef. We're cooks. Yeah, and that's, a, and that's another thing we have in common with you guys that we really love because we're a family of entrepreneurs trying to work together as much as we can, and you guys are doing that as well, so that's fantastic. But just to mention a little bit about the rest, uh, some more information about what you're doing for our audience, you have studied, Dr. Cowan has studied and written about many subjects in medicine, including nutrition, anthroposophical medicine, and herbal medicine, and, and he's an ardent gardener who has studied the diet and foraging ways of our paleo ancestors. Dr. Cowan is the kind of doctor I wish I had or wish we had near us because he blends holistic medicine with the best of modern medicine by utilizing plants first. He serves patients in his private practice in San Francisco called Fourfold Healing. Did, did uh, Dr. Cowan, do you accept long distance patients by chance? <laughs> uh, that's in flux right now. So we're working on how to do that legally and safely so okay all right well we don't really know right well when you let us know or if you want to test it out on the website if the fourfoldhealing.com website so yeah we yeah and we'll definitely link to that in the um article in the interview notes as well um yeah i've been there it's a lovely site so we'll definitely link to that put us on the list to call first when you decide to test that out we'll be glad to be your guinea pigs great <laughs> 
<laughs> so, so really, it's great to have you. I wanted to share for our guests and reminder for ourselves and what on the topics we're going to touch on today with you. It's again, we could go on for hours. And so my challenge is then to keep it focused on what will most serve the Gardens All audience and planting for retirement for today. Um, so we're going to touch on the secret life of plants. There are so many who may be familiar with that book, which is an awesome book. Dr. Cowan might call it something like upside down humans. So that's something that we will touch on. We'll touch on growing specialty crops, how it is that you came to um, get into specialty crops. We'll touch on superfoods and medicinal plants native to North America, as well as natural remedies and how to tune into what our bodies are telling us. Um, so let's just start with that. Uh, I heard you on the Ben Greenfield podcast, which is how I first discovered you. And we'll link to that podcast as well, because so we're trying to do to cover some of that, but to also talk about different things so that we can refer people to that podcast to hear some of the other things. And then I so you did two on Ben Greenfield, one about the cosmic heart um, sorry, I may be getting human heart, cosmic heart, and then the other about um, how to eat more veggies, basically. And then you also did an interview about the heart with Pedro so Shojai on The Urban Monk. So we'll link to those podcasts and try and cover a different angle of things. But on the Ben Greenfield podcast, you mentioned that uh, you went into essentially um, not even so much the tradition of why plant medicine works down from our, handed down from our ancestors, but essentially the symbology behind the plants and what it means that to, that they're so if you could describe what you mean by plants are basically upside down humans okay so some of this uh comes it, there's a history of this uh, so as i often tell people uh in spite of what my wife sometimes accuses me of i didn't exactly make this stuff up by myself uh, every once in a while i make something up by myself but not usually. And this is, this is a very specific case of plagiarism on my part. Uh, although I think it, if you acknowledge it, it isn't actually plagiarism. No, so, right. yeah. so the history of this is uh, in some people's estimation, one of the most important thinkers in modern history and certainly in uh, Western Europe was a guy named Goethe who wrote famously wrote Faust, but he was also considered the foremost scientist of his day. And uh, for example, came up with a theory of light, which is still considered the most sophisticated theory of light there is. Uh, and, and that's not all. I mean, he was a brilliant person. And uh, Rudolf Steiner, who I have been interested in for decades, essentially did his PhD thesis in philosophy on Goethe and named his building uh, that housed the movement that he started, Anthroposophy, the Goetheanum after Goethe. And the reason this is important for ask, answering your question is uh, Goethe said at the, near the end of his life, which was about 90 years, I think, the most important thing he ever did was discover the threefold nature of the plant. And he wrote a, actually a book on this called the Urflanza, which is um, essentially the archetypal, or some, I guess some people would translate that, the perfect or the imaginary plant. Mm. And so this is a guy who considered like the smartest person ever lived practically, uh, up there with Einstein. And he said the most important thing he did was discover that the plant has three parts. And those three parts are the root sphere, the leaf and stem sphere, and the flower fruit sphere. And being the sort of slightly weird person maybe that I am, I remember first reading that in my 20s and thinking something like, Damn, I knew that myself. <laughs> so, I'm the second smartest person who ever lived. Uh, anyways, that didn't seem so profound. Uh, except if you get into how what he meant by that. He meant that if you could picture the perfect plant, which, by the way, doesn't exist. It's just in our imagination. Mm -hmm. You would have equal parts root, uh, leaf and stem and flower and fruit 
And they all have certain properties, like the root sphere for it is always circular. So even a carrot actually has circular roots if you include all the root hairs. Uh, and so it's circular, it's the part of the plant that senses the world. Uh, it takes in nutrients from the outside, it senses the environment it lives in. Whereas the stem and the leaves are always green and they're the breathing and circulation part of the plant. Mm -hmm. The breathing is in the leaves and the circulation is through the stem. And then the flower and fruit part is the warmth, soul part, meaning it connects with you, the emotional realm through the colors. And it's the metabolic and reproductive part of the plant. Mm -hmm. Now, what Rudolf Steiner said was, uh, it's interesting that that's the opposite of the human being. So we have a head sphere, which is the sensing part, which is always circular or something like that. And we have a heart and lungs, which is the stem and the, uh, you know, the circulation and the breathing. And then we have a metabolic reproductive sphere. So it's a flipped upside down plant. And the, the reason this is so important is if you ask conventional scientists or maybe doctors, you know, how did, how did the traditional people come up with digitalis as a remedy for their heart? So first of all, it's digitalis leave and stem. So already, so anyways, the, the, the conventional answer is trial and error. They just gave a bunch of people digitalis leaf and see what happens. The reality is that's not how they did it. And, and they're very specific. They said they could read the book of nature and they could understand by their insights and their uh, understanding of the plant what this plant would do. Sometimes they even got more into it and said, the plant would literally tell them. Now, you, you have to be careful when you say tell them because the plants don't have larynxes and voice boxes, so, and they don't speak English as far as I know. Um, so they don't tell you by saying, uh, hey, Joe, you know, use me for heart problems. That, that, that would be silly to think that. Uh, that seems to be how we think, though. They, well, they didn't talk, so they didn't tell you but they tell you in other ways. So for instance, here's, here's what that, that model can help you understand. For instance, the color smell sphere should be in the flower and fruit, right? That's where the color and smell is. The green part and should be in the leaves and the stems. And the no color part the should, and the sensing part should be in the roots. But then you actually investigate real world plants, like for instance, a carrot. Mm -hmm. The carrot has changed the rules or worked with the rules, maybe is a better way, and decided to put its color, soul, you know, metabolic part in the root. Now, the first thing this allows you to do is even if you've never seen the flower of a carrot, you can 100% predict the color of the flower and the smell of the flower of a carrot. It's gonna be white and no smell. Why? Because that whole energy or sphere or, or, or color smell sphere, if you wanna use energy terms, has been sucked down into the root. And so there's no color smell stuff to be left for the flower, so it's gonna be white, which is exactly what it does. It also tells you that the most active part of that plant, medicinally or food-wise, is gonna be the root, and it's gonna help your senses, right? Because it's the root, it correlates with your senses, and then you put that together, and then you do $100 million of research, and you say, yep, Carrot roots help the eyes, <laughs> right? Nice. So I already knew that because I read Goethe and I know how to, to read the threefold plant. I know that root, that stems and leaves are going to come up with all the heart and breathing remedies, and they do. You can get even more sophisticated that plants 
essentially work with these principles to accentuate the flower. Some plants are all flower, like zucchini. I mean, they have some of each, but they have very little roots. If you look, and you can tell that because zucchinis are all fruit, yeah. right? They just pump out the fruit and you take the, the roots and they're nothing. You think, how did it do that? It's like they're, they're, they're a fruit pump factory. And you can tell that, anybody who's ever grown a zucchini, I'm sure your husband has, uh, you know that zucchinis are root, fruit pump factories, right? Yeah. I mean, yes. you don't cut them, they'll, they'll make thousands of them or hundreds or whatever. Yeah. So it allows you to start reading this book of nature in a way that you couldn't have otherwise and to start understanding what the strategy of plant an individual plant is. Mm -hmm. uh, and it also tells you that in the same way with the human, we should have an equal part head, you know, uh, rhythmical system, which is heart and lungs and metabolic system. And when your head system is in your abdomen and you get too much stillness and solidification, that's what we call gallstones. It's too much head in your belly. And too much pus in your eyes, that's what we call conjunctivitis. And you can start to see that most of the metabolic disturbances happen in your head, like ear infections and sinus infections and throat infections. All that stuff which should be warmth and pus and you know heat and activity, it's not supposed to be in your still cool head. You're supposed to have a still cool head. And anybody who doesn't believe me that their head should be still and cool, I just tell them, okay, spend a day going like this all day long. Move your head and, and put a hot water bottle on your head <laughs> yeah. and see how you feel. Yeah. yeah. Right? And yeah. that's, it's proof enough. Your head doesn't like that. It's round and cool and still. And I tell you, you can understand 80% of medicine just by understanding that threefold nature of the plant versus the human being. And I guess Goethe was right. And I didn't know what he was talking about. So I didn't really understand it until I read it. And then you study it for decades and you start to literally be able to read the book of nature. You can see a plant and you can see, here's what this plant is trying to communicate. Yes. So, so that's, and that's fascinating. And many of our people are either herbalists or into medicinal healing through herbs, which I know is big for right. as well. And, and I, so I was, as I was going over the, and hearing this again in the Ben Greenfield podcast, I was imagining you spending those many years you know, with every plant you meet, basically trying to figure out essentially like the uh, psychologist for plants. It's like, what is it trying to tell us and what does it represent? So along those lines, I know our gardeners will be doing the same thing. Uh, so something like um, echinacea, which you know, the, the root is medicinal as well as the flower and the flower has color and the root doesn't or ginseng um, where it seems to me from what I know that the ginseng root is the most medicinal and yet it doesn't have color. And then one other that came to mind along lines of what you said about the carrot, the blackberry is exactly like what you were saying. We just did an article and an interview with a blackberry farmer and the flowers are white. And the berries are very black or, or you know, purplish, bluish, that sort of thing, so where, where the concentration of nutrients are. So that makes sense there. But what about the other variations? Because I'm sure you've studied those. So, you know, again, every plant is a variation on the theme. And, and sometimes it's simple, like a carrot, and sometimes it's more complicated. But the, the, the way of understanding this that Goethe laid out in this book and that Steiner accent, sort of accentuated or embellished on is, is also based on trusting your own sense. Now, I would admit you have, to, you have to practice that. Like the first time you do it, you probably aren't as good. Just like the first time you dribble a basketball, you're not as good as Steph Curry is. But... But, um, but, but you learn to look at the plant or experience the plant better more than look at it and trust what you see. So if you take something like echinacea, you see this sort of looking fairly balanced plant, although it's 
I would say the the leaf and 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 stem sphere certainly doesn't stand out. So it's a bit like a it's a dramatic flower and a and a strong root, right? Mm -hmm. and the, so you wouldn't expect that the leaf and the stem have much to do with it, and in fact, they don't. So then you look at this beautiful flower, and, and you don't see the root. The roots are always a little hidden. And for me, when you look at this flower, you would say, oh, that's a beautiful flower. I'm going to go feel it and smell it, right? Because that's what you do with flowers. Right. And what do you get? You get this hard rock of a of a flower, which actually almost like pricks you because it's such a, it's like a, it's like a stone, right? You, yeah, the core, and, yeah. And, right, the, the, the core of the, fla of the flower has, it's like a rock. And what's the smell of it? Nothing, yeah. nothing. And you think to yourself, like, what's your problem? Like, <laughs> You know what I mean? Like, it, compare that experience with a rose, yeah. right? Yeah. A rose is all flower, right? It's just all flower. You know, it has a structure behind it, but you, nobody would, would question that. It's just all flower. So what does it mean then that this flower, which looks pretty, so it's fooling you. Plants like to play tricks on you, but it's really a root because the root sphere is the sphere that's like a stone, right? And it has no smell. It does have color, so it wanted, it's playing a trick on you. But it's essentially saying, I'm gonna concentrate all my medicinal qualities into this root sphere. And I'm even gonna put some of the root up into the, up into the flower. Um, so you can even take some of the flower and make that into a medicine. It won't be as good as the roots, but I, I'm permeated through and through with the hardness and the lack of smell. And it's, it's actually not a very sort of soul-inspiring experience uh, picking an echinacea, right? It's not. Not like a rose. There's no smell, and the color actually kind of fades away. It's just these little petals. It's more like this calyx, I think you call it, in the middle. Yeah. And so what does it do? It, it clarifies the nerve sense part of the person. What do I mean by that? If you have a sinus infection or an eye infection, you have unclarified nerve sense activity. It's pus. And so if you give somebody clarifying nerve sense activity like echinacea root clarifying it means restoring it back to that stone-like crystallized form which is normal for your head it's not normal for your for your abdomen but it's normal for your head and so it's a treatment for colds and ear infections and sinus and all that so you know it's a but it's a trickster because it tried to fool you with the color yeah and of course, somebody else could interpret it differently, but I think I'm right. So. <laughs> well, that makes sense. I mean, in a way, yeah. in a way, it's like the flower is like the flag that's waving to get our attention. Like, hey, yeah. look what's down here. <laughs> I'm a root. Yeah. I'm a root in flower form. Yeah. So I got the color part, but I don't have the smell or the soul experience that you're looking for. And, uh, and then we have the cruciferous type. Uh, vegetables like and I, I realize these are Johnny come latelys as far as our our you cultivated. know cultivated vegetables but it's the flower of the broccoli or the cauliflower that um, we consume to to our benefit uh, the bud yeah the bud sorry the, yeah the, yeah it's the difference it's the flower in 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 what they call in status nascende, which means it's a flower in becoming. But if you wait till the broccoli becomes a flower, you lose it. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, so you've got to get it before it actually flowers. So uh, in that case, the flower, the, the blossom or the bloom is hard. 
the broccoli and the cauliflower. So does that mean that then, would you say that they're also good and beneficial for the upper part of the body, the head area? Well, but broccoli is a, is it's, you see, anytime you see green, that's a leaf. That's a leaf. So the leaf has actually invaded the flower sphere. Hmm. <laughs> so the whole plant is a leaf. Now it can't be a, be a, it's a flower. And it, you see these insignificant little yellow petals of a broccoli flower. So the flower part has been literally bred out of the plant. So it's, it's for sure a leaf plant. Inter and that, what's interesting about that gardening, we, um, we see how prolific the leaves grow and yeah. they're the abundant thing. And so, and what's odd is that you rarely see those for sale in the store and yet they're perfectly edible, taste yes. and very nutritious. Yes, but the plant has put even that leaf energy into the flower sphere. And so you get a combination of leaf flower. Um, so, it, you know, I would say, and it also concentrates sulfur, which makes it into a sort of a detoxifying plant. You know, an interesting correlation with this is cabbage, which is also essentially all leaf. And it's, it's, the, it's the border between the head and the, and the true leaf sphere, which is the, which is the heart and lungs. So it's a swollen area between the heart and the, between the head and the heart, and that's a goiter. And sure enough, eating too much cabbage causes you to get goiters. Yeah. So it it's telling you this. I give you a goiter unless you know how to work with me. Yeah. <laughs> which is making it into sauerkraut. Yeah. Yeah. Sour. So. And it's kind of. I mean, as hard as it is, it's also shaped like a blossom. You know, the way that opens. Yes. The, the petals. Again. The flower sphere of a cabbage, most people have never even seen it, but it's almost insignificant. It's all flower, it's all leaf. What was that book that you mentioned by Goethe that you said? Um, it's called the Urpflanze. Spelled O R U H R P L A N F A N Z E or something like that. Okay, we'll find it with that. Is it fairly dense? I mean, would the average person be able to? No, it's a, it's a, it's a 80, 60 pages of, of just, of like little pictures. <laughs> <laughs> Every little content in there. Okay. Uh, about anything. It was, it was about metamorphosis, how the leaf becomes a flower and all this stuff. And he makes you draw, like cut out little pictures of, a pl plant in the, in its all its different stages to get you to understand it. Okay, cool. So let's move into the. Yeah. Well, we um, you're very big on specialty crops, and um, the one thing I wanted to ask is, what led you into this journey toward uh, specialty crops? You could talk about vegetables in general. Uh, we know there's a lot out there in terms of the paleo traditions and uh, the, the, in your book on vegetables, you cite the California natives back in the day. Um, and your focus you initially was on the, the, the non-vegetative things like the meats and, and the nuts and all that. So what has led you into this realm of uh, specialty crops? And exotic plants. And, and exotic plants, vegetables in particular. Yeah. So I, you know, I, I tell people my food compass is a combination, is mostly based on Weston Price, which very briefly is there was, it turns out there was groups of people who had essentially no disease, including dental disease. They had perfectly healthy, you know, 32 teeth their whole life, no orthodontic problems, no cavities. And that's a far cry from what we have now. And these same people had no cancer, no heart disease, et cetera. So I decided, well, I'm gonna figure out what they ate. Um, and Price had some things about that. But so what I came to was they had three food groups. One was uh, animal foods for, for proteins and fats. The second was seed food for carbohydrates and energy and fiber and stuff. So like fish and 
seed food could be pine nuts or acorns or grains or nuts and seeds, etc. And they were properly prepared and soaked and sprouted and all that. And the third group was uh, vegetables and fruit, which are usually 80% vegetables around 20% fruit. And <clears throat> what I explained in the book is that because of nourishing traditions and because of the paleo movement, we pretty much have access to those first two groups. We have wild fish and you know, free range grass fed animals and good dairy products and all that stuff. And we have, you know, organically grown heirloom seeds and nuts. But, and here's the big but, is though traditional people had, and, and I used as the example that you talked about, the native Californians ate about 110 different vegetables a year and about 10 to 15 per day. And this included annual vegetables, perennial vegetables, wild vegetables, root vegetables, leaf vegetables, fruit, flower vegetables, all different colors, red, orange, green, etc. Those that, the vegetable part is like they're, they're loaded with minerals, vitamins, phytonutrients. They're how plants prevent disease and and be nature being conservative. It's also how animals eating plants prevent disease. Hmm. Yeah, you contrast that with the normal American diet where some studies have said Americans eat seven different vegetables per year, which includes ketchup and French fries, <laughs> and yeah. iceberg lettuce, and carrots soaked in poisons, etc. Yeah. So this is a disease-preventing deficient diet. And no surprise, they have a lot of disease because <laughs> they don't prevent disease. That's the... That's the part of the diet that prevents disease. Right. Now, and one you mistake. Uh, you mentioned also that a lot of these uh, vegetables have been converted to high carbohydrate content. Yes, right. So we've taken wild potatoes and wild grains and made them and bred them to be almost exclusively carbohydrate foods. Carbohydrate is essentially the non-essential slash almost poisonous part. I mean, we need some carbohydrates, but so the modern agriculture has exacerbated this problem. And literally Americans live in a food desert, particularly vegetable desert, including the most conscious eating people there are. Because if you go to the, to the farmer's market, so you've got away from the normal groceries, you've got away from Whole Foods, you've now shopping exclusively at the farmer's market. And believe me, because, you know, being who I am and fiddling with food, I tried to eat 15 vegetables a day for 20 years. And you can't find them in, in farmer's market. You can't find perennial vegetables. You can't find wild vegetables. I mean, sometimes in San Francisco, like the food capital of the world, you can find wild ramps and fiddle pets. Uh, so, uh, you know, it was a big job. I ended up figuring I had to grow them myself or forage them myself or pay people to forage them for me. And then we ended up starting a company, Dr. Cowan's Garden, where we take these wild or foraged vegetables or perennial vegetables or diversity of vegetables and we literally make them into powders and try to retain all the nutrients. So now I don't have to spend an hour and a half before work uh, chopping vegetables and collecting 12 different ones, you know, every morning. That's, I mean, I did that, but you know, it's a bit of a pain. Um, uh, so now I have my threefold blend and I sprinkle that on my food and it's pretty much the same thing. The, but the point of what your question was is that the part of our diet that, that in theory we know that we need a diversity of vegetables, but the practice hasn't caught up with, is growing tree collards and sea kale and ashitaba and, you know, miner's lettuce and fiddleheads and wild ramps and wild onions and, and turning those into usable food mm -hmm. and if we can sell a million copies of my book to sell, to convince people that they need that 
these are the vitamin pills of disease prevention better than any vitamin pill you've ever eaten. These are nature's pharmacy and you can't get them. There's a market out there for somebody to grow them and bring them to the farmer's market, sell them to us, we'll make them into powders. You know, there's a whole lot of make kimchi out of them, preserve them. There's all different ways of going from, I'm gonna grow and pick miner's lettuce and tree collars and ashitaba and sea kale and I mean, you know, rhubarb and all, all these different amazing perennial vegetables, moringa leaves, uh, Malabar spinach, genura, which is Okinawan spinach. These are amazingly nutrient-filled, disease-preventing plants. It's all over the PubMed, you know, abstracts of how Okinawan spinach, a perennial spinach, prevents diabetes and all this stuff. The, the facts are out there. The translation of it into a, a food policy I mean, we're not even close. Well, I had a question in, in relation to the, a lot of the ones you listed are a bit beyond us in the temperate zone in, in growing yes. you know, the, the high, rather the lower ag zones. Um, now, we've, we've been fascinated with things like dandelion. Yeah. And uh, plantain. Yeah. Um, these other things, they're just you know, basically weeds. Right. Most. And yet um, we see potential there. Do you have any recommendations on, apart from, uh, now tree collards maybe can grow down south of us, we're in North Carolina. We're zone seven. We're zone they, seven. I think they can grow in Florida. Yeah, in but uh, for, for the folks out there that we're trying to help out, what are, the, um, what are the vegetables we might start growing on our own that you would recommend that you might might accept as a powdered material, in other words. That you look for for your powders and tincture, yeah. that tincture that Well, let me qualify that, you know, just to be clear. I mean, right, I'm a doctor. <laughs> okay. and, and I know something about gardening, and I've gardened for my most of my adult life, and I we have a approximately one acre garden garden in Napa that I'm kind of the manager of. I don't do all the broad forking, thank God, anymore. Um, but so there's people who know more about this question than I do for sure. But what we're looking for as a company and is, is whatever perennial wild vegetable grows well in your area. Mm -hmm. So what we're looking for is you know, we, we like things local to a certain extent, but for instance, we'll get, uh, we'll get choya buds from the Sonoran Desert, which were a Native American, their bud of, of a cactus, which is a wild food that they use to prevent diabetes and probably the calcium richest bioavailable plant food in the world. So they gave it to uh, pregnant women and young children to help grow bones and et cetera. So, that's not local to us, but it's local to them, and it's sustainably grown and wild harvested and in a very good way. And so that's their food. Now, plantains probably don't grow in the Sonoran Desert. So we go to a different place that has plantains, and you just have to look at, at what edible vegetables grow in your area, wild mustard. And then the, the beauty of powdering it is you know, the difference between wild vegetables and, and cultivated typically, you know, is wild vegetables are less, are lower in carbohydrates, lower in sugars, and higher in phytonutrients, which are the disease causing part. But modern palates find that troublesome because they like sweet things. Mm -hmm. uh, however, if you do it and you put it into powder and you sprinkle it over your food, you know, we figured out that you retain 95% of the nutrients. And there's studies like black cumin seed powder, you know, treats Hashimoto's, we found out. So the powder is medicinally active. And it's not so offensive in taste. You can put it in chili. You can put it in, you can make smoothies. You can 
but make macaroni and cheese if you're into the, eating that for you know children who won't eat vegetables and make it green macaroni and cheese and <laughs> but nobody you don't even really you know it's like i i find myself talking out of both sides of my mouth because some of our powders and some way of doing this really accentuates the flavor so it's the most flavorful food you'll eat so i say yeah it really brings out the flavor and then the other side, I say, yeah, you don't even taste it. Yeah, well, it depends on what it is. Well, and, it depends and on what it is. One of the points you're making with the powder is that it is a concentrated form yes. of the vegetables. So you don't have to, you know, on a every five minutes, chow down on, on some vegetable. It concentrates it. Yes. In and that's a good point, because when you're eating 110 a year and 15 a day, you're not eating kale salad for lunch you're eating a little bit of kale a little bit of whatever broccoli and a little bit of carrots and a little bit of horseradish and because you don't need you're not trying to get use kale for calories or protein i mean one of the things that i think is so ironic is people say oh yeah this is a high protein vegetable i mean we do that too uh but you, you don't eat kale for protein <laughs> eat meat or fish or dairy products or if you have beans and rice that's not what the beauty of kale kale has phytonutrients that prevent disease you don't need tons of kale or tons of any of that stuff you're looking for diversity mm -hmm. so a little bit of plantains a little bit of wild mustard a little bit of this and again as you say if anybody can grow i mean a little bit doesn't help us because we need to make, you know, two, three hundred jars. But if anybody can make, you know, a, a pallet of wild mustard powder, they should call us up and get in touch, drcowensgarden.com, and we'll we'll make a deal. That's good. Got to be wild, sustainably harvested, no cooties, you know, no weird stuff. Right. Yeah. Right. And what, what are the prices for powdered vegetables like that? I'm presuming you buy them concentrated per vegetable. So like you buy the concentrated kale, you buy the concentrated wild mustard, et cetera, or not, and then you blend them, correct? Yes. Uh, I, I don't know what exactly what we're paying for the dried product. A lot of the stuff we either grow or get from farmers that we contract in the Bay Area or local organic farms and we dry it ourselves. So, but you can't do that if you're in North Carolina grow, then you'd have to powder it and we'd have to work with you on how you powder it and et cetera. So that's a bit of a process. I mean, we're, we're not the solution for everybody here. Sure. Right. But, um, but you know, we're, 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 we may be the solution for some. You'd have to do it like we say, because we also, one of our mottos is we we process the vegetable as you would or at least you should in your kitchen mm -hmm. so i am for instance not an advocate of eating raw kale because kale has it binds up the nutrients in cellulose which we don't break down and it has bitter principles which are not so good for you after all the plant doesn't want you to eat its leaves mm -hmm. right because then it dies hmm. so if you look at kale it goes from green to and bitter to really green and sweet and then it goes to mushy and yucky and we want to eat it when it's really green and sweet and that's when the nutrients are most available and the taste is the best and, and we're not talking about overcooking we're talking about blanching or steaming for sometimes 20 seconds and then we fix it there by drying it at that point and and it's different and i because i didn't just say we don't eat raw vegetables because some we do uh, like lettuce you don't cook lettuce it doesn't have much cellulose the nutrients are available without any processing but cabbage you ferment and you know etc that's culinary arts Right. So we do that so you don't have to do it at home. All you have to do is this kale is at its optimal nutritional potency 
how do we know? And we judge that not so much by analysis, although we're probably going to get into that a little bit, but I don't trust the, that thing. I trust if I look at it and taste it and smell it, that's what I want to know. Yeah. I'm the chemical analyzer. Yeah. Well, that makes sense. And, you know, back to what you're talking about relative to your local area and whether you may not be the solution for everybody. But the good news is that uh, whether it's selling to, you know, Dr. Cowan's garden of products or the other, the next guy, because there are a number of companies now making powders pr pretty much for the same reason that you are. And that is to make you know, essentially our nutrient starved population have more access to the things that we need um, in ways that we can digest them and get enough of them. So there are other growers that people, or rather other product developers and makers, manufacturers that people can sell to. So folks in your area, in particular California or San Francisco, um, they can definitely contact you. But beyond that, the exciting thing for just gardeners um, is that we can make, like you started out, making our own. So Gardeners typically, obviously, they, we can things, we freeze things, and we, we preserve them by making, like you said, sauerkraut, you know, pickling, fermenting, freezing, canning. Um, but most of us haven't thought to take that huge amount of extra leaves or whatever and create a pow our own powders. But that's how you started, right? Yeah. And I just... It in spite of, you know, I don't mean to be argumentative here, but there are other people doing powders, but they make two huge mistakes, in my opinion, which is why ours are better. One is they typically do them raw because it's cheaper. Raw? And we know this because we've tried to figure out some machinery and some pro like co-packing arrangement that could help us out, and there's basically doesn't exist. They take kale and all this dried kale is raw and it, I wouldn't eat it. It's See, not right. Now, have you, you're speaking of not eating it because, and no, I'm glad you mentioned that because this is, these are the kind of things we need to understand and consider. Um, are you thinking because of the flavor or because of the nutrient quality or both? Both. It's, it's raw and that's not the way to eat kale. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I could be wrong, but I don't think so. And, and I know how they do it because I know these, uh, I don't know, I wouldn't say I know all the other people who do it, but that's how they do it. And the other thing which, I, is, which we do that nobody else that I know of does is we pack them in mirin jars. And these are these deep purple jars. They go back to the time of the pharaohs. They've been reverse engineered by the Swiss company. They only let in UVA and a few other wavelengths of light. And believe it or not, things don't degrade in there. So if you take a raw kale powder and put it in a, in a plastic bag, in, in a month or so, there'll be no smell or taste, and nobody would want to eat that. Whereas ours, uh, this one even could argue that, that the vitality of the contents increases because of the exposure to UVA light over time. Oh. And for those who don't believe this, and I didn't believe it either, but we have a, the pictures on our website. We took two more or less identical cherry tomatoes. Uh, they're obviously not identical, but they were from the same plant, picked at the same time. They looked the same size. We put one in a glass jar, like a mason jar, and one in a mirin jar, and we left it on the counter. No refrigeration, no nothing. And in approximately a month or six weeks, the one in the mirror jar was gooey, stinky, you know, moldy mess. And you, it was you six months. You what? mean the glass jar. You said in the mirror. Glass jar. jar. Okay, the glass. The one in the glass jar was stinky and moldy. And it took six months before the cherry tomato in a mirror jar started to go bad. Amazing. Literally, you could eat it after five and a half months. We didn't because that would ruin the test. But, <laughs> But that convinced me that, <laughs> and there's no, no refrigeration. We didn't put it, you know, it was on the counter. So all cooking and everything was, you know, we didn't even climate control it or anything. Yeah. Uh, and so that convinced me. And I, I, I have some powders that I've had for two years sitting in these jars, like chamomile powder. I powdered chamomile um, blossoms. I grew it, powdered it 
I guarantee you could smell that, you could identify chamomile within one second of smelling opening the jar. Mm -hmm. Now online, uh, I did a little bit of investigation on the Marin jars. It looks like there's a number of knockoffs. Yes. And Don't use them. Are, are they work. bad Don't. or are they an improvement or how would you judge those? And how can you tell? How can you tell? Well, they should say, it has to say Mirin jars and from a place that sells Mirin jars. That, that it's a patented technology, so nobody else can make the same color or the same thickness. It's based on the color and the thickness. So I've seen like people who pack coconut oil in cobalt blue jars, they say. And basically it's, I mean, that's, so they put a glass jar and they put a cobalt blue piece of like paper. It's, it's like that filmy sort of transparent paper stuff. They line the jar with that. And there's no evidence that I know of that that does any good at all. Okay. Well, so people, I haven't really studied it, but it, it makes sense. Um, so we'll definitely link to the Murin company. It sounds like a, a great product. Um, I would think that some of the colored jars might help, but it probably doesn't have the same you know, it would be an interesting experiment. Yeah, buy it. right. There's brown jars and, you know, there's people who use violet plastic jars and I wouldn't do that either. Right. Mm -hmm. and, you know, there's no doubt this jacks up the price. I mean, if you go to our local health food co-op, they sell the same mirror jar that we put our powders in, the jar for 20 bucks. Yeah. Now, we don't obviously buy them for 20 bucks, but that's a lot for a jar. It is, yeah. <laughs> so we're not buying them for 20 bucks because we buy them in bulk. But, but that just goes to show that these are, the, I, wasn't, I was not willing to do this company except for that we agreed to put them in mirror and jars. And, you know, the finance people were like, well, this jacks up the price and we can, right. But I'm not going to do it. Yeah. Well, it's it's uh, economy of, of uh, energy, and you're not having to refrigerate. You're having yes. the product last longer. You make a lot of arguments on the other side. Yes. And we did compromise a little bit, and we sell. We're, we're, we don't have so many available yet, but they will be very soon. Sort of refill pouches, so you can buy threefold blend that has roots and leaves and fruits. Mm -hmm. you buy it first in a mirror jar and then you can get the refill and just what we want you to do is take the, the pouch empty it into your jar immediately right. yeah yeah, makes, yeah sense. It makes sense yeah. so t let's talk you talk you spoke earlier about um you touched on the concept of perennial vegetables um having more nutrition and you mentioned that in the ben greenfield podcast as well and i was intrigued we were talking about that coleman and i were talking about that just this morning where it hadn't occurred to me that most all the vegetables that most of us eat most of the time are actually annuals, not perennials. Right. Um, so, I mean, that's something I hadn't even thought of. And so you shared on that podcast, why it is that the perennials are more nutritious, which is some of those that you've already mentioned, you know, that what we're terming exotic, but many of them are just not necessarily exotic, but I call it exotic because you're not familiar to most of us, but right. they've been out there in the wild forever. Um, so could you explain a little bit more on the perennials and nutrients? You know, one of the, one of the things that I, I call my medical work, work sometimes kiddingly, it's like doc, doctor strategy for idiot doctors. <laughs> I, I essentially say, okay, you have this disease. I don't really exactly know what's wrong with you. Nobody knows what's wrong with you. Maybe it's from a molybdenum deficiency. Maybe molybdenum catalyzes some enzyme that you don't have uh, and you don't have any molybdenum and that's why you have trouble. Now, as far-fetched as that sounds, you know, a lot of veterinary medicine is exactly that. They say these cattle are sick, they don't have enough zinc in their soil, give them a salt lick with all the minerals and they all get better. And the Chinese have extensively studied it. They, they've identified areas in their country where people get certain diseases and they're, they're selenium deficient or this. And so it's, the trouble is it's very complicated to figure that out. 
So if you're a dumb doctor, like maybe I am sometimes, or maybe all the time, I just say, just eat them all and we'll be fine. Your body know it will figure it out because I don't need to. Sure. sure. Now the problem with that is you need some plant or some animal, I guess, that's getting access to all these minerals. And maybe you need anthocyanins of B or some, you know, lutein or something. Now, if you if you have a moringa tree, which is lives for 50, 80, hundreds of years, wow. has roots down into the subsoil and beyond, it has access to all those. And you can prove that moringa leaves have basically every nutritional nutrient, uh, mineral that is, not nutrient, mineral that has ever been discovered. So I don't need to, I don't need to know anything. All I say people is, here, take a teaspoon of moringa powder every day. If it happens to be that your trouble is mineral deficiency, it will be in there because the tree mined the soil for it. So it happens we sell moringa powder, we put it in our high protein blend, which is half moringa powder from a very protected place in you know the Sonoran Desert. The moringa trees like to grow there. All the minerals, just about every nutrient that's ever been discovered is, be, is in those moringa, so that's a perennial because it's a tree. And all you have to do is eat, you know, 50 moringa leaves a day, which nobody does because where are you going to get moringa leaves from? Right. So we just, you know, powder it and there you go. And that's the strategy. And if you, if you do a hundred of those a year, I can guarantee you will end up with every nutrient available and you don't have to calculate it. The plants are much better. They do math better than we do. Uh, they know how to find these nutrients. But if you're growing it on the same soil annuals, which can only go this far in the root zone, mm -hmm. they may not have access to it. That's and then idea. you've lost because you're eating only a certain limited spectrum of the plant world. Right. That's the problem. Especially, um, especially if it's, the soil's been disturbed. I mean, then... And especially if the soil's... So if all you're putting is NPK back in the soil, you're going to have deficient plants and deficient people who get sick. And then you come to me and then I don't know what's the matter with you, but it's because you're, you're in a, you're nutrient starving. Right. And speaking of coming to you, if you get sick, uh, we have only two minutes left because I know you have another appointment. Um, if you have a chance, you mentioned on Ben's podcast, which we'll link to so people can hear that the plant, for instance, that you might recommend to people who come to you for diabetes um, and that you start, always start with plants, which I love. That's what we do as well. So what kind of plants might you recommend for restoring balance, such as, you know, problems like candida, uh, even menopause, which is sort of like a hormonal imbalance or allergies, which tends to uh, occur in systems that have been weakened? Yeah, that's a pretty complicated question for two minutes. Yeah, for two minutes. Okay, more like 20. Uh, I mean, yeah, that's, a, that's sort of how you do medicine. Okay. But you basically start with my threefold food scheme. I like threefold stuff. Yeah. You can do all the diversity of vegetables. And more, most of the time, all those things you talked about will get better. Okay. Well, you said you like threefold things. But your practice is fourfold healing. So tell us that before you go, if you can. Yeah, that's because there's a whole nother way of there's a fourfold and a sevenfold and a twelvefold. And so we just talked about four areas to, to address and healing, which is movement, uh, food, uh, medicines, and thinking. So that's the fourfold. Nice. Very nice. Well, this has been wonderful. I really appreciate you taking the time to, to spend, to share with us your incredible knowledge and wisdom. Like I said in the beginning, we have so much we can, more we can learn from you. So hopefully we'll, we'll be able to do another one and touch on those things we couldn't get to on this one. Should we get his right. website? Yeah. One more time? Yeah. We'll put it on the uh, article, but it's fourfoldhealing.com is his practice. And then humanheartcosmicheart.com. Um, and again, we'll link all of those so people can add. And the drcowensgarden.com is the 
is the powder business where the farmers should contact us. Okay, good, okay. good. Thank you, Dr. Cowan's Garden.com and the Facebook page. So we'll link all of it. Okay. okay, well, awesome. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Okay. okay. Bye, bye bye. See you. Bye. Bye.